though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. If you um, have done any study of biblical warfare, you understand that statement. It comes from David, a warrior. Armies would typically line up on the hills on either side of a valley, and when they fought, they would rush towards each other and meet in the middle. The valley was where the battles were fought. The valley was where people died. The valley was in the shadow of the mountains next to them, and the valley was an ugly place. And if you are in the valley, you know that feeling. You might feel hunted. You might feel worn out. You might feel weary. But though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. He will guide you. So we praise him. And as we enter this next portion of Nehemiah's life, he continues to walk through the valley. He continues to suffer attack. But um, the, the methods change a little bit as we, as we go along here. When I was about to enter sixth grade, I had uh, achieved something that I, I truly have been looking forward to for a long time. My brother had been going to camp with Awana for years, and uh, you know he's four years older than me, and I finally got the opportunity to go, and it was this exciting thing. Camp was an interesting week. It was a uh, spiritually formational week for me, and it was an amazing week. But as a part of that week, there was a conflict between a couple of us. You know, you stick a bunch of uh, pre-adolescent boys in one room, and there's bound to be a little bit of spark here and there. But as this one progressed, it got to the point where we decided we were going to have it out with each other because, you know, we were such expert fighters. And um, as we approached this moment, I had a friend that I had made in the cabin. And that friend, I didn't realize till later, when I had never heard from him again or spoken to him again, you know, my best buddy throughout that whole week, I realized later was constantly in the background pushing the buttons. He wasn't going to get into a conflict with someone. He was going to watch someone else do it. Very manipulative, very constantly, um, very focused on driving the levers. Getting everybody to go the direction he wanted, running in between. Making statements. Pushing things forward. You know, that incident comes to mind. It came to mind years later when another Awana missionary, who was kind of a little bit of a mentor to me in some ways, asked me to be the speaker at his camp. I thought, wow, I get to be the speaker at a camp. What a privilege. Then I thought about, wow. You know, my first year at camp, he was the director of the camp. And I thought, how different things would have been if the Lord hadn't gotten my attention in the middle of the week and I'd gotten into a fight at camp and gotten kicked out by that man. Kind of an interesting moment. As we were studying the scripture one day, we came across a verse and it said that you were to endure. You were to endure trial as a good soldier. And I thought to myself as a sixth grade boy, I'm a pretty lousy soldier because I'm letting myself get twisted around with this whole thing. And that one friend of mine, but you can't back out of this. Uh, yes, I can. I have to. And after I did, it was kind of funny because we're in the bathroom and in walks my counselor. So what's this I hear about a fight? Well, we're not having one. Oh, really? What happened? Told him what happened. Okay. It's amazing what you think you know and what other people may have reported 
And to this day, I wonder how my counselor would have found out other than perhaps someone was telling him things. We come into Nehemiah 6. There is manipulation going on. There is rumor going on. There is attack going on. And just as surely as that friend of mine, that acquaintance, was not really my friend, Nehemiah has people that are not his friends. Some are declared enemies, and some are not. And you will have dealt with this in life if you've lived long enough. The difference is how this man of God handles it. You'll notice from the get-go, it's a battle over the truth. So, read with me if you would. As we look at Nehemiah chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand, in it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. We start with the outsiders trying to worm their way in. You'll notice there is a, a difference here that stands out throughout the whole book. It stands out throughout the whole Bible. The man of God speaks one particular thing. The woman who is following the Lord speaks a particular thing, a particular way. The world speaks another. And if you'll look at these two things, they are contrasted here. So we start with the wall has been finished. The breach is sealed up. There's still a little work to be done, but the biggest thing remaining is the gates. It's all but done. The breaches are sealed. The enemy can't come by night and simply attack. They can't interfere with the work the way they've been trying to, and it has failed. The plotting to come by force has failed, and they're almost done with the work. And that puts the enemy into a panic. Have you ever seen an enemy in a panic? There's a reason that we use the term to describe someone exceptionally ferocious as he fights like a tiger. Because tigers, being hunted in India specifically, would often be, they'd have to be corralled and cornered, and then you'd go in for the kill. Well, when they were cornered, they'd be at their most dangerous, very unpredictable, and very aggressive. The enemy is cornered. The only thing you can predict is that they are going to fight back. They're going to continue fighting. So they send him a message. They say, come let us meet together. This is a good sounding thing, is it not? After all, they're proposing a meeting. Shouldn't a good godly person accept that meeting well there's a problem not only does he know that they're up to no good but Nehemiah also has 
a calling from God and a very specific work that he has to do. And his decision is between doing that work or being nice and risking himself. We have made niceness next to godliness sometimes, and that is not a biblical thing. He is not rude. He doesn't call them a bunch of names. He doesn't go and um, turn into a, a bully himself. But he says this, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Give me a good reason. There's no reason for me to come out and meet with you right now. And he knows what they're up to. This message goes back and forth four times. What an interesting situation. They're reduced to sending messages because they can't get him any other way. So they're trying to get him to come out in the open. They're trying to get him to come meet with them. Sure, the king will be displeased when a servant that he favors is killed, but they can blame it on bandits. After all, everyone agrees. We have the story right here in the newspaper. You'll find that the enemy never lacks for having friends. And the enemy is not one that is truthful. We start out and they are lying. Let's meet. We've heard. No, I'm not coming down. The fifth time, they sent a servant with an open letter. Now, this was an interesting thing because correspondence would be rolled up. It would be sealed with a wax seal. It would be private between these people. An open letter is a veiled threat. An open letter is something that anyone can read, that he knows people have read, that the messengers have read or could have. An open letter means that it's a public thing. So they're trying to manipulate Nehemiah through public. So they've tried privately, and although they go publicly. Here's their message. Look at verse 6. It's reported among the nations. Oh, and by the way, Geshem also says this. He, he confirms this, that it's been reported that you're setting yourself up that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. Now, we know you wouldn't do such a thing, but we need to figure out how to deal with this, and squash these rumors together. That's the implied message here. And if you don't come meet with us, you're obviously up to no good. And this message is public. You'll notice a couple of key things used by the enemy here. The enemy is not speaking the truth. The man of God speaks the truth. There's a battle for truth. That battle is throughout the whole Bible. To me, in many ways, it culminates when... Jesus says, I have come that you may know the truth. And Pilate says to him, what's truth? This is where we are. The truth is at stake. You'll notice what they do. It's being said. They start with rumor. They send it an open letter. There's public pressure. You should come down. There's manipulation. The enemy always uses these key tools. This is how it works. And then, in the middle of these lies, in the middle of this pressure, this rumor campaign, 
this manipulation that they are attempting to use on Nehemiah, they say this, And you have also, in verse 7, set up prophets to proclaim, Concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of this. You don't think you've got something to lose? You've got something to lose, my friend. Think about that. We start with one thing and we just keep progressing. The pressure ramps up. The methods get more devious. But the message is the same. We distort the truth. When you look at cults that move in and try to distract us from Jesus Christ, from the gospel, from God's word, what do we do? We distort the truth. We go after who Jesus is. We go after what Jesus has done, the significance of it. Any cult you look at, they will change his identity. They will change his Death, burial, and resurrection, and how that affects us, it will change our relationship to God. This is how we go about it. We distort the truth. For the man of God we got to, and woman of God, we must cling to it. Now, Nehemiah declares the truth here. He has said... I'm in an important work. I don't, I'm not coming down. They send him this extra report, <laughs> the open letter, the editorial in the newspaper. And he says, in verse 8, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your mind. He declares the truth. Again, he doesn't go with a bunch of insults. He just says, you're making this up and I know it. It's a very plain statement. It's a pretty harsh one. Again, it's not about being nice. Loving people does not always mean nice. Loving God does not always mean nice. But at the same time, are we rude? Are we cruel? Do we do the same things? Do we spread rumor? Do we apply pressure? Do we lie? Do we manipulate? Look at the pattern of your life and how you get things, and you can see whose side you're on. It's a scary thought to look at. But he says this in verse 9, For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. Again, fear. Fear. Using fear over and over again. Just different tactics to try to get fear inflamed. How do we inflame fear in people? We cause them to believe lies about their enemy. How do we get people to fight and kill each other? We dehumanize the other person. Here we are. God strengthen my hands. And now you'll notice this shift. Once again, they changed tactics, but the basis of what they do doesn't change. The world will always use instigators. People who apply the pressure, who spread the rumors, who share the lies, who manipulate. And here in verse 10, he goes to a friend. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, and he keeps going, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, we don't know why, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. Seems like a friend has arisen. Someone who is warning him. Just like I had a friend at camp, someone who was manipulating me. Here is this friend. 
And here's Nehemiah's response. You'll notice that the truth is consistent. The person who declares the truth is consistent. Nehemiah is studied up. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved to God that you may be a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Nehemiah understands that. That hasn't been even written yet at this point, but God's character hasn't changed. Studying his word hasn't changed. Being a workman hasn't changed. He said in verse 11, should such a man as I run away? In other words, a man of God on a mission, a man who has been assigned a job by the king, should I just run for it? No. And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? He knows something very important. I will not go in, and I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy... So this guy is actually a prophet against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Here's the issue. Nehemiah wasn't a priest. He didn't belong in the temple. He couldn't rightfully go in it. Yeah, it might be a safe place with nice big doors. But here's the tactic. We will use the ends, justify the means. You are God's man. You should be protected. Have you ever had a temptation to do what you shouldn't do because something good was on the other end of it? Now they're trying to get Nehemiah to do something to protect himself, to protect maybe even the building on the wall, but they're trying to do it through something that is wrong. And they're using a prophet to do it. You remember what their earlier accusation was? You're hiring prophets in Jerusalem to declare you to be king? You'll notice that, once again, those instigators, those people used by the enemy, oftentimes accuse you of the very thing that they are doing. I've had those thrown at me. I've seen them thrown at other people where it's so weird. You go, what in the world? You're accusing that person of that? How is that even possible? That person's the exact stellar opposite of that. You, on the other hand, what happens? If we're a liar, we accuse the other person of being a liar. If we have... Infidelity and bad morals, what do we do? We accuse the other person of doing the same thing. One needs only look at a good political campaign to get a feeling for this. I don't care whether it's local, national. Just take a look. Because what are we doing? This prophet has been hired. He gives him a statement that they're coming to kill you by night. That's his prophecy. He knows it's not necessarily true. They don't have the chutzpah to try to do that in Jerusalem. But you need to go hide in the temple. He knows that that's wrong and forbidden. Trying to use the wrong thing to achieve the right goal is just as bad a distraction as anything else. And you'll notice Nehemiah remains consistent. He's focused on one thing. He's focused on the mission God has given him. Are we that focused on our calling? Are we that focused as Christians, as believers, on what calling we have? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Verse 13, for this purpose... He was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin so that they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember to buy on Sambalot, oh my God, according to these things that they did and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of all the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. They've been using more than one. 
This guy's just the example that he uses. Fear does amazing things. One of the biggest things in this life, I think, that sometimes prevents people from doing great things for the Lord is fear. What if people really know who I am? What if people really know? What if people find out this and that? There's a reason that blackmail is a crime and is a very common thing in this life. And it happens in small doses and big. It happens in churches. It happens in governments. It happens in families. If people know. The enemy uses fear. What does rumor do? It whips up fear. What does public pressure do? It provides fear. Fear of what people will think or say or do. What do lies create? A misimpression? Quite often, fear. How does manipulation work? Fear. We're manipulated when we fear losing a relationship with someone so we'll do what they want us to do. We're manipulated when we have fear of what other people will think or say or what our public image will be. And the thing is, as they're trying to use that fear, what are they really trying to do? Damage his public image. Nehemiah knows this. If they can say, look at this guy, he's a hypocrite. And we'll find out exactly why he's considered a hypocrite if he goes into the temple. A little later, they were a little bitter over this. Fact is, he had kicked someone out of the temple who shouldn't have been there. And so you can see how the fight comes back. When you have the truth manipulated, it always, always brings you back to this position where Nehemiah is, where someone is trying to take the speaker of truth and make them a speaker of lies or make them look like a speaker of lies. Nehemiah remains consistent. He declares truth. He's not drawn to their level. And he's not fixated on the situation at hand. No, no, he's focused on the goal, on the end result, on where he has to go and how he has to get there. He's focused on the great work and he will not be distracted from it for personal gain or for anything else. Where do you land on this? This is a pretty convicting one for me because the thing about Nehemiah that really blows me away the most is how consistent he is. No matter what they throw at him, no matter which tactic, he's consistent. And it's challenging to me to be that consistent to think about being that careful. And remember, when things get personal, it's really not about you. It's about the truth. When people attack, when people talk religion, science, politics, whatever it may be, in the end, the fight is between truth and lie. And Satan, who is he? The father of lies. Jesus says, you are the children of your father. We are the children of Abraham, say the leaders. What do you mean? No, you're the children of Satan, <laughs> of your father, because he speaks lies. The dangerous thing was those guys who knew all that doctrine failed to practice the same thing as Nehemiah. They twisted the truth to their own ends instead of simply speaking it and living by it. I encourage you, if you find yourself in that position and you realize, I'm a manipulator, there's an issue you need to work with, with God. If you find yourself in the position of being attacked, remember, speak the truth. Live it out. Don't take it as an excuse either 
when the truth is convenient to use as a weapon to be cruel, to be unkind, but also don't shirk from speaking the truth to those who need to hear it. That is the hallmark of the believer. We'll finish chapter 6 with this. In verse 15, all this is going on, but you see Nehemiah's consistent plotting in the right direction, his consistent work. And he says in verse 15, So the wall was finished, and on the 25th day of the month, Elul in the 52 days, and when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They can see the truth. And it causes them to fear. Jerusalem is on the rise. It has favor with the king. And it is no longer despised. The only way this can happen is if their God is working for them. When Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the Roman general who did it walked away from the situation and said, it's almost no victory to defeat a people who have been abandoned by their own God. That was his statement. It was obvious that God was allowing that to happen. Even a pagan Roman general knew it. He knew he hadn't accomplished much because he knew that Israel's God was judging Israel. And here, these people see that it's been done with the help of God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. Here's a little the tidbit for you. And Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobias sent letters to make me afraid. It just continues, and you get this little snippet. Where have the nobles been buttering their bread? By sucking up to the local authorities. And now that Nehemiah is here, this is a problem for them. And they're willing to be used. We've got to do something about this guy. And yet, the wall is finished. God is in control. He is on his throne.